Hello, welcome back to the Tour of Pleasure here in the Enchanted Kingdom of Hermione. As always, I am the Lord Chamberlain of the Enchanted Kingdom and your host, Zip Gun. Going to go to number five on my personal journey through music. <coughs> if you have, if you wonder what, what's going on here, you're probably advised to go back to number one and start there and hear about how me, I, and millions of others like me discovered the Beatles and the Stones and the Who. And in the last one, I discovered jazz. Um, and jazz and, and Chicago. And Chicago kind of opened up and there was, so there was this beautiful flowering of what became known as prog rock and about 1970 or so and one of the benefits of the new fm radio that was completely changing everything for me and a lot of people was that you it it existed sort of in a different place from am radio sometimes they could work together and a really good example of this was the band yes and yes came out and i don't know when it was 68 i'd never heard of them they didn't break out really anywhere where i heard music but then when fm radio started and their third record came out the yes album and that was a hot record it was on fm radio there was a single all good people um sorry your move I don't know, all good people. I think your move was just by itself on the single. It didn't quite do much as a single, but the combination of the AM and the FM kind of took it over the top. And I remember hearing it and, and really liking it because it was very progressive. And it had three things that really knocked me out for what I guess would have been about 1970. And that was they had a really cool churchy organ which nobody with a, that dirty Hammond organ, but he played it really like a churchy kind of organ. And I really liked that. And I really liked the bass player and the drummer. They were really something else. And just the way it sounded. And John Anderson's voice was interesting because it was, it was different. Nobody quite, like, nobody sang quite like him. And so I got into the Yes album and it was a big record for me. Got me into things like synthesizers, um, even though there's hardly any synthesizers on that album. Um, but um, I would credit FM radio with really taking that band over the top right then. And they became a pretty popular band. And prog rock became popular suddenly. And um, the album after the Yes album, the Yes album, sadly, they hired, they fired the guy who I thought had the great churchy organ sound, but they hired Rick Wakeman and he brought synthesizers. You betcha. And they also really had this thing about, you know, we're going to show you what we got kind of thing. And so Fragile, which I bought the day it came out, I guess, had, had probably their biggest hit on it, Roundabout, which needless to say got chopped down to about four minutes for the AM radio version. FM played the long version. FM played the whole record. And the great thing was, it was apparently done pretty quickly. And um, it's not even really a whole album as such. It's essentially four songs. Um, Roundabout, South Side of the Sky, which I still think is a great song. Long Distance Runaround and um, Heart of the Sunrise. And then there was these little solo things. And all every man jack of the solo things are great and like some of them are really great but john anderson's is terrific and um i absolutely love this record and it really got me into that kind of rock music it had to rock that's the thing always in my life it didn't work if it didn't have a kick-ass rock beat to it and so that was um that was kind of the that was when suddenly all these prog rock bands showed up 
bands like Gentle Giant showed up. And uh, I got into Gentle Giant. I got into um, uh, the whole Hatfield and the North and um, Canterbury scene. A uh, soft machine I had gotten into around the same time. And soft machine again were, they were the gray area between the yes style prog rock and the jazz that I was discovering. And really, when you listen to soft machine at this distance, a lot of it is jazz, it's just straight ahead British jazz. And yeah, maybe it used a Fender Rhodes piano, or maybe, you know. But it was, they evolved into a jazz band, sort of, pretty much a pure jazz band. And then they kind of turned into maybe a fusion jazz band. But, um, and there's a lot of that going around. Eric, uh, Ian Carr's Nucleus, the box set I just did, which I reviewed a while ago, they were right in on this whole thing. The Mahavishnu Orchestra. And, um, and bands like that. The Mahavishnu Orchestra were pretty popular. Um, and then finally in 1970, funny for me, finally about 1971 or two, two, um, on FM radio, there was this weird record that I really liked that they played a fair bit. It was kind of the, the song off the album that got played because the album was hopelessly uncommercial. Nobody was going to play any of it on AM radio. And yet they were a fairly well-known band. And the song was Ladies of the Road by... King Crimson, which is this lurking, hulking kind of beat song, I guess you would say. But it's in weird, there's lots of weird time in it, and there's some, it's, it's a great, a great song. And this was my introduction, believe it or not, to King Crimson. Even though I'd heard, I know I'd heard Court of the Crimson King, I thought it was okay. I had heard Talk to the Wind, I thought it was okay. And I'd heard on late night FM radio, Moonchild, the whole Moonchild, the really weird jazzy bits at the end again. So they were kind of a jazz band too. Really strangely, I never heard Schizoid Man until much later, never once heard it on the radio. And I never owned a copy of In the Court of the Crimson King until later. The first record I bought by King Crimson was Islands of all things. And so I got into them kind of strange. I plopped into them just as they were disintegrating um, and didn't know it. Um, and then I really liked Islands. I thought it was a really good record. And so I started going backwards. I bought Lizard and then I bought um, Poseidon and then finally bought Crimson King. Finally discovered Schizoid Man and thought, wow, this is a, a neat band. But I discovered them in this reverse order which was kind of unique. And then, uh, and remember, I'm in, you know, Western Canada, 1972-ish. And then silence. Nothing, I hear nothing out of the band. And meanwhile, my other favorite band at the time, Yes, have done Close to the Edge, which I thought was a pretty darn good record, if it does kind of die in spots. And, um, you know, they, they were redefining the fusion, or the prog rock genre really side long songs you know and then um i forget when it was it was in the summer i think i got the news that bill bruford who by now was my favorite drummer in the world and who was maybe my favorite musician in the world really really liked bill bruford and chris squire i really liked anyway bill bruford was quitting yes and i was devastated jeez man just when you were getting going just when they were starting to make money what is he thinking? Christ. And so now it was like, yes, we're going to go on with this new drummer who I initially I didn't like Alan White because I was such a Bruford fan. And they made this double album of sidelong songs, which even I thought was maybe going a bit too far, even when I was like 15. And I, there was nothing out of King Crimson. And uh, because I didn't read Melody Maker or anything. I didn't know that they had put out a truly dreadful live album that was so terrible that um, Atlantic Records passed on it and um, they had reformed. So I was listening to, uh, what was it, the 
there was a new album hour on CKLG FM. They did it for years. I think it was every Sunday they'd play some new album by some band or another in its entirety, which is still pretty avant-garde thing back in those days. And lo and behold, they said, well, they're going to play the new King Crimson record. And I was like, oh, cool. And then he goes, look at a new lineup. And he goes to the lineup. And he gets to Bill Bruford. And I just about hit the roof. I mean, you mean Bill Bruford quit my favorite band up until recently to join what is now my favorite band? And then, of course, they played the whole Lark's Tongues and Aspic record in its entirety. And basically, I had my mind pretty thoroughly blown and they've been a favorite ever since. And that edition of the band was a real, and remains, a real favorite of mine. And they fit in with my discovery of, and the thing is, of course, like I say, they, they rock. When they rock, they rocked hard. And their live performances with the Bruford wet and rhythm section, and when Jamie Muir was with them, amazing, amazing stuff. The stuff that the very, very best kind of, creative rock music could ever be, in my opinion. So, yeah. Um, that was sort of... I discovered bands like PFM, Primiata Forneria Marconi, who were kind of like ELP. Now, ELP I kind of discovered along with all these other bands, but I never quite loved them the way others did. I had a buddy of mine, I, Simon Hopper, and he was more into them than um, I was. So we kind of had this thing. I was into Yes, he was into ELP. ELP did some stuff I liked. <clears throat> Again, you know, when you make a record called Works Volume 1, you're just like, okay. Because you know there's going to be a Works Volume 2. Um, happily, they ended their career with Love Beach, which was one of the most spectacularly terrible records ever made by anybody. And so I didn't feel so bad that they were gone. And... Um, but PFM were different. They were kind of the Italian ELP in that they had um, a really good guitar player and they had a violinist who doubled on flute who came in really handy in a lot of places. And they really sounded Italian. And they were a really good prog band. And I remember when Simon and I went to Vancouver in 1974 to go see them. We were 15. And... Um, uh, Went and saw them on a bill with Santana, followed by Chilliwack, or sorry, what was PFM opening, Chilliwack, and then Santana. And we stayed for PFM, and then we left because we didn't want to watch Chilliwack or Santana, which is too bad because it was Caravanserai era. Santana probably would have been pretty good, but we were, we were done. We saw PFM, and that was it. And that same year I went to Vancouver and saw, or in 1975, went to see Kraftwerk. It was another band I discovered. Um, just in my travels. And uh, Crafter, of course, are impossible to really, I mean, techno. Techno rock, I guess they invented it. They invented a lot of things. And uh, when they played in 1975, they were touring Autobahn, and they put on a fairly traditional rock and roll show. And when I saw them in 2013, they put on a pretty crazy, but still somewhat traditional rock and roll show, including a little sort of solos at the end of their, their encore. Amazing band. Anyway, I, I guess we're going to stop. This is where everything starts to kind of boil into the mid-70s. And I had discovered um, bands like Weather Report, who I still have a soft spot for their first few records. And I discovered... Um, oh, boy, I know I'm forgetting a few. Um, started to actually study some of these artists because I had a chance to acquire a lot of stuff for cheap. So I started listening to Duke Ellington, started listening to, um, you know, old jazz, Louis Armstrong, and I started listening to Miles Davis. Um, and I'll get to Miles, I think, later. But um, Miles, when he was putting out the stuff that I regard as his very great rock stuff, funk rock stuff, I didn't get it. I heard it. It didn't make any sense to me. And only later, when I sort of revisited it, thanks to a review by Robert Christgau, who reviewed Agarta and mentions Pete Cozy's guitar playing. And I went back to that record and went, wow, he's right. This is nuts. And I still think it's great. I still think that era of the band is one of the great 
rock bands of all time, even though it's kind of a jazz band, but you know what it is. Um, and um, so that kind of spilled over. That came later, but that was part of the same thing. I still have a very, very soft spot for prog rock and jazz fusion of the first half of the 70s, let's say. And there was a lot of good, a lot of good came out of it. A lot of Brazilian fusion kind of really broke the um, dam for Brazilian influence music. And um, guys like Ayerto made some great fusion records. And Egberto Gismonti and guys like that. So the fusion, a lot of it is really, like I was listening to Chick Corea's Return to Forever, the early stuff. The... Um, well, the mid-period, I guess I would say, with the dweepy little Yamaha synths. And it's great, but it's terrible at the same time. Um, you listen to it, and you kind of, I don't know. It sounds very dated, to some of it. But I was listening to a Larry Young, a completely shameless fusion record the other day, and I was loving every minute of it. So, you know, there you go. It's, it, it's sort of a style that's gone. Nobody does it anymore. Um... It's hard to do. It's hard to play. I, I played in a couple of bands where we aspired to play this style of music. And I'll tell you what, we had to work at it. So, um, yeah, so that's basically the early half of the 70s for me. And um, disco never made much of an impact on me. I liked Rod Stewart's disco song. I thought, thought it was a smart idea for him. And it's not even a terrible song. There was a few disco songs I liked. I liked I Feel Love. I think I still have a 15 minute long version of it. But yeah, up to the mid 70s, it, it's, that's where I, my, I discovered ECM records in about 72 ish and really got into all things ECM. And there's very few bad records on ECM, I'll tell you that. And they're all very well recorded. The attention to detail is almost extreme. And sometimes they're tweezed maybe a bit too much, but I, Manfred Eicher, the man behind ECM, knows how to let some people just put them in a room, put Harold Russell in a studio and just let him make a record. Great, a good guy, he's done amazing things for music. Um, thanks to him, I got to see Keith Jarrett in the church in Victoria, 1975. I think it was a month before he recorded the Cold Concert. And thanks to a QP strike, we had to put him in the cathedral, which was brilliant. And I just sat in the aisle and watched him do his 1975 Keith Jarrett thing, which was great to watch. Very impressive. Um, yeah. And I'm going to end it here, I think. Because a couple of things happened later that we're kind of didn't put a date on. Them. So I'll end it here and say thanks for watching hope it's remaining somewhat coherent uh because it gets a little bit spidery at this point um don't forget to hit subscribe and the like and um all of that and yeah take care of each other and don't take any wooden nickels and we'll talk to you later thanks bye